Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Accounting and Reporting Update for Tribal Government. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters, Ryan Lukemeyer and Ben Hancock, Senior Managers in Moss Adams Tribal and Gaming Practice. And with that, Ben, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, so over the next hour, we're going to talk through some recently issued and proposed GASB standards that are likely to affect your tribe or tribal organization. And this is going to include their potential impact and what you should start thinking about to prepare for implementation. So here's our agenda for today. Uh, we will be summarizing the five different GASB standards seen here that you may have heard about, and they focus on debt disclosures, fiduciary activities, equity interests, leases, and construction period interest cost. And these require your attention now as they're going to be effective soon with some effective as early as fiscal year 2019. And then lastly, we'll provide a quick update on a GASB project that proposes changes to the GASB 34 governmental financial reporting model and that's currently open for public comment, so we'll, we'll finish it off with that towards the end. And with that said, it looks like we've actually arrived at our first polling question. All right. Our first polling question, what type of entity do you work for? And your options are A, tribal government, B, tribal casino or other enterprise, C, state or local government, or D, none, I'm self-employed. And I'll give everyone a few moments to respond to participate in our polls today. Please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. A few more seconds. Go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. Okay, great. Thanks everybody for responding. So it looks like overwhelming majority of you work at a tribal government, but then we also have a good representation of tribal casinos or other enterprises. 
as well as some state and local government employees. So just a reminder, this is uh, geared towards Indian tribes and their enterprises and the GASB updates and how they affect them specifically. And there's actually a few that are self-employed as well. Okay, so let's get right into it. Uh, our focus today, as I said, is to cover future GASB standards that are broadly applicable to tribes and their organizations, um, but there are some other GASB standards that are effective now that you may have heard about as well, but they are not as broadly applicable as what we're going to discuss today, so I will not spend any additional time discussing these. Um, so the first you see there is GASB 81, and that's effective now. And again, not a big impact on tribes or tribal organizations. Uh, it covers irrevocable split interest agreements, uh, which are fairly uncommon at tribes. In some cases, a tribe could potentially uh, take donations, maybe through a foundation if they have a tribal college, but we don't see that very often. Um, but if you do have that type of activity, this standard provides guidance uh, for the situations where a government would be a beneficiary of one of those split interest agreements, and that would be where a donor irrevocably transfers resources to an intermediary, and then the intermediary administers those resources for the benefit of the government as well as at least one other beneficiary, i.e. the donor. Um, so again, not very common at tribes. The second one there is Statement 75, um, and it's applicable for the 2018 fiscal year ends. And it covers some changes in accounting for OPEB for employers. And OPEB stands for Other Post-Employment Benefits. And this standard replaces the requirements of what was previously in GASB 45. Uh, so you'll just want to be aware of this one with the takeaways being one, you should review the types of OPEB plans you may have, uh, two, understand how the liability reported for the employee benefits are measured, and then how they should be reported in the notes to your financials. And then third, just learn about what would be required to be disclosed as RSI, which is the required supplementary information that goes in your financial statements. And then the next one on the list here is Statement 85, Omnibus 2017. So Omnibus is just a term that means comprising several items. Uh, GASB 85 serves to clarify some things regarding a few topics, uh, including blending component units, reporting negative goodwill, uh, fair value measurement, and then accounting for uh, and other post-employment benefits. And then GASB 86 is another standard effective for 2018 year ends. It covers debt repayment. So it just serves to bring some consistency to accounting and reporting for repayment of debt. If you've had trouble debt restructuring with your tribe, it's something you should probably look into, but we generally don't see other topics in the standards applicable to tribes. Um, primarily in substance defeasances, uh, which is covered in depth in this one. And then lastly, uh, GASB 83 is another standard applicable for 2019 year ends that we will not cover today. It provides guidance for when a government has a legal obligation to perform future asset retirement activities related to fixed assets, and then how to recognize that liability for that future obligation. And this one, like the others, is in general not broadly applicable to tribes. It is worth noting, though, that some tribes have landfills, and there's specialized accounting for that, but this standard does not change the current accounting for post-closure of landfills. So I just want you to be aware. So what will we cover today? Well, there are five standards here, and the effective dates apply over the next several years, depending on your, on your fiscal year end. Uh, so without further ado, I'll just get right into the first one you see there, which is GASB 88. So GASB 88 was issued in April of 2018. And it's effective for fiscal years ending in 2019. So if you're a 930-19 year end or a 1231-19 year end, uh, that'll be applicable for that year. Uh, its purpose is to improve the consistency and usefulness of financial statement disclosures related to debt, including providing a definition for debt. 
and it does require some new debt disclosures and the notes to your financial statements. Now, the first item you see on this list here is the amount of unused lines of credit would need to be disclosed. And one thing I just want to note on this is that even if you have a zero balance on your line of credit at your end, you're still required to disclose the amount of line that's available at that time. And then the last couple bulleted items here on this list require assets pledges collateral on the debt to be disclosed, as well as certain terms in your debt agreement, such as subjective acceleration clauses to be disclosed. An example of this would be failing to maintain satisfactory operations that could trigger an acceleration clause. So you just want to be sure to check if any of your debt agreements contain such a clause, and if it does, then it should be disclosed in the notes to your financial statements. And one other, one other key feature of GASB 88 is that it calls for the separation of the disclosure of direct borrowings, such as your typical bank loan, uh, and direct placements, uh, such as when tribes issue bonds that would be tax-exempt or non-exempt. And historically, for those direct borrowings, the disclosures of future, future principal and interest uh, used to be separate from the placements and bonds, but now you can include everything in your long-term liabilities roll forward, but the distinction is that you would want to show totals for each of those categories. And what I mean by that is there would be one total for direct borrowings, one total for direct placements, and one total for bonds. Uh, this is also an opportunity to look at what you're disclosing as long-term liabilities, uh, particularly if you're a casino, as many times casino financials will have multiple categories of debt, and they can be multiple pages long in your financials. So you should definitely review that standard to make sure your financials are disclosing debt appropriately. And you might have already been disclosing everything, but this could also be an opportunity to pare down a footnote if you had been disclosing too much information in the past. And this is the long-term liabilities roll forward I mentioned. So just take a fresh look at the forms of long-term debt you have that would go on your long-term liabilities roll forward. Most tribes, even if they don't have debt, do have a long-term liability roll forward schedule in the notes to your financial statements. And at a minimum, that will contain the year-over-year -year activity of compensated absences. Uh, this is still required under the new standard, but it specifically calls out what we just talked about in the previous slide and that you need to distinguish between direct borrowings, direct placements of debt. So in summary, your debt disclosures might not change based on the new standard, but it's important to know that although there are some new debt disclosures, the old debt disclosures seen here on this slide still apply. Uh, and the first bullet there, the debt maturity schedule, that's the most common. And that concludes our GASB 88 overview and it looks like it's time to go to our second polling question. All right, our second polling question. Do you have the following at your tribe or tribal organization? Your options are A, 401k plan, B, minor's trust, C, both A and B, or D, none. And as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. This is our second question. Everyone, a few more seconds. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. Okay, interesting. So about half of you have a 401k plan, but then only around 2% have a miner's trust. Uh, I did expect more of you to have miner's trust. Um, and then, oh gosh, okay, this is both A and B, so around 35% would have a miner's trust. That makes more sense. And then none, about 17%. This is kind of what I expected. So we'll be definitely covering miner's trust and 401k plans in detail, so you'll definitely want to take note of this next section here. Okay, GASB 84. Uh, fiduciary activities. So this was issued in January 2017 and is effective for fiscal years ending December 31, 2019, so end of this year, or if you're at 930 year end, it'd be effective for the year ended 930, 2020. 
the goal of this standard is to enhance the consistency and comparability of fiduciary activity reporting, as well as improve the usefulness of fiduciary activity information. So why did GASB take on this project? Well, it was primarily to address the wide diversity seen in practice, particularly around reporting or not reporting 401k plans as fiduciary funds in your financial statements. And what I mean by that is in some cases, there's, there would be similarly structured 401k plans at different tribes, but then they were reporting them differently from tribe to tribe. And it's mainly just because people interpreted it differently. Uh, similarly, at business type special purpose governments, such as casinos, there's also been that wide diversity in how to report the 401k plans. So Gatsby took this project on in order to come up with a framework to evaluate the activity that determines whether it's a fiduciary fund and then how to report it or not report it in the financial statements. Uh, miners trusts are another example of where there's been this wide diversity in practice, so we'll talk through examples of 401k plans and miners trust reporting here. But what exactly is a fiduciary fund? Well, fiduciary funds are somewhat unique to GASB as there's no equivalent reporting under FASB, which is probably a big part of the reason we've seen such diversity out there. And the best way to describe a fiduciary fund is that the government is responsible for overseeing certain activity, such as 401k plans or miners trusts, but then the assets held as part of the activity are not the government's resources, and thus are off limits for use by the government within their own programs. Uh, there are four different types of fiduciary funds, and you see them listed here. A part of benefit of GASB 84 is that GASB hasn't really defined fiduciary funds uh, since the late 90s when GASB 34 came out. So they're now defined in GASB 84. And for each of the categories you see here, that activity is required to be presented as a column in the financial statements and requires separate disclosures as to what they account for. And it's important to note in regards to tribes and their business activities, such as casinos, the GASB 84 has different applications, but the primary impact we want to cover today is on the clarity it provides regarding how to report the first item you see here, which is a pension trust fund. And that includes defined benefit plans, i.e. pension plans, and defined contribution plans, i.e. 401k plans. And the other item we'll cover in detail today is that third item on the list, private purpose trust funds. That includes minors trusts. There are exceptions, but in most cases, 401k plans will need to be included in your tribe or business type activities financials as a pension trust fund. And then for minors trusts, in most cases, they will not be included in your tribe or business activities financials as a private purpose trust fund. Uh, there are a couple other types of funds in this list. You see there, including investment trust funds, most tribes do not have external investment pools that would meet the criteria for an investment trust fund, so we'll skip over that today. And then for the last item on the list, if you happen to have an agency fund type in the past, it will now be presented as a, as a custodial fund. Previously, agency funds only include the balance sheet, uh, known as a statement in that position, but now they'll include a flow statement and the balance sheet. So if you happen to have an agency fund, just be aware that it's now known as a custodial fund, and you'll need to track inflows and outflows in your general ledger if you haven't previously been tracking that info. Before we move on, I also want to clarify that even if fiduciary activities don't qualify to be reported within a fiduciary fund in your financials, this activity will still be recorded somewhere in your financials. It's really just a matter of geography. For example, a 401k or a minor's trust that doesn't qualify to be presented as a fiduciary fund will still be in your financials, but instead it would be within a special revenue fund or maybe as part of the general fund. So not going away totally, it's still going to be there somewhere. Here are some fiduciary activities you may have at your tribe or tribal organization. Uh, you should be aware there are other activities that could qualify as fiduciary activities beyond just 401ks or miners' trust, such as pensions or potentially even certain pass-through grants. 
But again, even if you have produced your activities, there's still an assessment you need to go through to determine if they include uh, get included as a fiduciary fund in your financials or presented somewhere else. Let's talk through a 401k plan example. In order to determine whether a 401k plan should be included as a pension trust fiduciary fund in your financials, you first need to determine if it's a component unit, which would mean it's to be included. And there are certain criteria that go into a component unit evaluation. Uh, it's under GASB 14 and then GASB 39. And the first criteria that would point to the plan being a component unit is whether a trust exists. And if there is a trust in place, that one, the plan contributions are irrevocable, two, the plan assets are dedicated to providing benefits, and three, the plan assets are legally shielded from creditors, then the second criteria that supports the plan being a component unit is whether it is legally separate. And then the third criteria seen there is whether there's specific financial burden placed on the tribe. You're probably wondering what that means. Well, the standard clarifies the tribe has a financial burden if it is legally obligated or has otherwise assumed the obligation to make contributions to the plan. Our discussions with GASB indicate that if you have historically made employer contributions to the 401k plan, which most of you do, or if you communicate to employees that there is a matching or employer contribution, that you likely have assumed an obligation to make contributions. And that interpretation is consistent with what was in GASB 45. The fourth criteria there supporting the plan being a component unit is consideration of who the governing board of the 401k plan is. And this is a fairly big deal. So in, some case, in most cases, as seen in number 4A there and 4B here, the tribe is named the plan administrator and generally appoints the trustees of the plan. But if you have a situation where the 401k plan does not have a governing board, implementation guidance says whoever's performing governing type activities is still considered to be the governing board of the plan. Well, what are governing, governing activities? They include things like the ability to amend the plan document, appoint the custodian, appoint the trustees, appoint the third party plan administrator. But ultimately, plans could have a governing board or a governing body, or there could be people that make the argument that trustees are the governing body. So we just need, need to look at who can perform those governing activities, which dictates who the governing body of the plan is, even if there is not a named body in the plan document, which there usually isn't. So overall, if these criteria are met, the 401k plan would qualify as a component unit and be presented as a fiduciary fund. If for some reason your 401k plan does not meet the component unit criteria path, there is still a chance it can be included as a fiduciary fund. So this is the alternate path, and it considers one, whether the plan is administered through a trust, and two, whether the tribe controls the assets. So number one there is self-explanatory, as there is either a trust or there isn't. In regards to number 2A, it's possible it won't end up being presented as a fiduciary fund if the custodian or trustee holds the assets of the tribe. In regards to 2B, it's also possible that if the employees participate in the plan and direct which investments are selected, you could make an argument the tribe isn't controlling the assets. So based on the criteria we just walked through, it appears many tribal 401k plans will meet the definition of a pension component unit and then will be included as a fiduciary fund in your financials. As a result, there are a lot of tribes out there that have not included the plan activity in the past, and they will now need to do that in a fiduciary fund. Uh, if you are already receiving a 401k audit, you should definitely look to determine when that audit occurred in the past so you could potentially coordinate those efforts to include the audit information. And as part of this, you'll need to determine if you've received a 401k full scope or a limited scope audit because a full scope audit, which just means the investment activity is audited, is required for a clean opinion on your fiduciary fund. So now that we've discussed the tribe's 401k plan reporting criteria, it's important to also discuss the impact on business type activity 401k plans. And note that when I use the term business type activities, I'm referring to tribal casinos or other businesses that might have their own 401k plans. Let's walk through an example of a casino 401k plan and whether we need to include it as a fiduciary fund or not. 
Uh, presumably, though, the 401k plan activity will end up in either the tribe or the casino's financial statements. So we just need to determine where it goes. The first thing to consider is how your casino is presented in relation to the tribe. There are three ways it could be presented, as you see here. The first option would be where your casino is not determined to be a legally separate entity and thus is shown as a fund of the tribe. In this case, the 401k plan uh, the casino employees participate in would be presented as part of the tribe's financial statements. And then options two and three are when the casino is a legally separate component unit of the tribe, which requires a series of questions to evaluate where it goes. So if it is truly legally separate and sponsors its own plan, we need to determine who the plan's governing body is. And that's generally by who appoints the trustees and the plan sponsor. So if the casino or the casino's board is determined to be the governing body, then you would include the 401k info as a fiduciary fund within the casino financials. But if the tribe is the governing body for the plan, then the 401k info would be presented as a fiduciary fund in the tribe's financials. So ultimately, what the GASB 84 is saying is the 401k info needs to be folded into the statements of the casino's governing body, whether that's the casino, the casino's board, or the tribe. And the casino may sponsor its own plan, but when the four, where the 401k actually gets folded into depends on who the governing body of the plan is. So it's also worth noting that if the casino participates in a larger plan sponsored by the tribe, which happens a lot of times, then presumably the 401k info will go on the tribe's financials. But we still need to look at who the plan's governing body is to make sure. So if we've determined the 401k plan of the casino needs to be presented as a fiduciary fund in the casino financials, what does that mean for the audit opinion? Well, there's really three options we've identified. The first option would be to include that info as a fiduciary fund in the casino financials and the auditor issues a clean audit opinion. Good result. Then option two, let's, let's say you choose to exclude the 401k info. Then that results in an adverse opinion and for option three, you could issue a standalone casino enterprise fund on its own, excluding the 401k info. Then the auditor issues a clean audit opinion, but also an emphasis of matter paragraph indicating statements do not prefer to represent the casino as a whole. So these are the options we've identified for now. Uh, you'll need to make an informed decision in regards to which option you choose. And you want to really consider who the users of your financials are. Obviously, the first option is good because you're presenting the financials as GASB requires. You receive a clean audit opinion. But then for two and three, there's some further analysis you need to, to make, such as whether lenders or maybe the NIGC would accept that presentation. And keep in mind that we have not confirmed with NIGC whether they'd be okay with options two or three. Um, so please keep that in mind. So now that we've hit the highlights of the 401k plan treatment, you may be concerned that your tribe's fiscal year end differs from your 401k plan year end. So let's run through an example here. So if the tribe has a 930-19 year end and is ready to issue their audited financials, but the most recent 401k financials are available are from 1231-18, what do I do? Well, the answer is you would just fold in the 1231-18 audited 401k info into your 930-19 tribe financials. Okay, so that covers 401k plans. And the other topic here we want to really cover is miners' trusts and where they go. So as I mentioned earlier, miners' trusts generally are not going to be presented as a fiduciary fund, but there are cases where they could be. There are questions to be addressed, and the first threshold seen here is whether or not there is an actual miners' trust document. So if there is a trust document, you need to determine if the miners are the beneficiary, as well as whether the assets are dedicated to providing benefits, and that the assets are shielded from the tribal government's creditors. And if all of those items are true, then your miners' trust could qualify as a fiduciary fund of the tribe. Although, generally, we've seen the trust document doesn't include that specific language. And if that language is not included in the trust agreement, then it wouldn't be presented as a fiduciary fund. 
And from what we've seen, a majority of minor's trusts are actually within a legal trust because IGRA, which is the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, requires it. But our understanding is that many times the language in those trust agreements says the assets are available to the tribe's creditors, which is a result of being able to provide the preferred tax treatment for payment to minors. If your minor's trust is not in a national trust, then it would not be presented in the fiduciary fund, but instead we would be reported uh, within maybe the general fund or a special revenue fund of the tribe. Again, it's just that geography, where does it go? Um, this is because in the absence of a trust, when you look at who owns the assets to determine whether the, the government controls them, we could assume in the absence of a trust that all assets are in the tribe's name and available to the tribe, as nothing would prohibit them from accessing the funds other than they've restricted that fund balance per se. There could be a scenario maybe where individual bank accounts are set up in each miner's name, but you also need to look at who the authorized signer on those accounts would be, and if the tribe's the only signer on the accounts, it makes it more difficult to determine who really owns the assets, and whether it's fiduciary or not. Also, without a separate legal trust in place, the miner's payments are effectively profit distributions, such as from gaming activities, and thus would be the tribe's own source revenue. So that's more like a per capita payment, as miners' trust distributions can't be part of the tribe's normal services to constituents, and a per capita distribution is a normal program of the government, therefore it gets kicked out. So let's say you do have a fiduciary fund you're going to report, uh, whether it's a 401k or a miners' trust, you'd report a statement of fiduciary net position, as well as a statement of changes in the fiduciary net position. So you just want to make sure you have accounts set up in your accounting system or to report that activity. There's been a lot of questions, as you, as you can imagine, on GASB 84. So an implementation guide was issued in early January of this year, and that's still open for public comment with comments due by end of February. As of now, the implementation guide does not appear to provide relief for including 401ks and similar type plans as a pension trust fiduciary fund, and there are no apparent changes to the conclusion that minors trusts are likely no longer fiduciary. So it's worth taking a look. And so that concludes our, our recap of GASB 84, and we are going to move on to our third polling question. All right, our third polling question. How do you stay up to date on changes to GASB accounting standards? And your options are A, I look forward to and diligently read the monthly Moss Adams article. B, visit the GASB website once a year and skim through the pronouncements page. C, hear about it from my auditor. Or D, learn about it through attending conferences. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them now from the folder that says slide deck and handouts to the right of the slide view. We will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. And let's go ahead and see what everyone has to say. Back to you. Thank you, Emily. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to talk a bit now about uh, GASB 90. This is the newest standard in the GASB universe. We'll be celebrating 100 before you know it, the way the GASB is going. So let's get started here. Uh, GASB 90 was released in August 2018, and uh, the expectation is what, that it would be implemented right away in 2019 because um, there was a bit of confusion with the release of GASB 72 when defining investments. Governments and tribes could acquire uh, majority equity interest in companies that were for profit generating purposes, but they also could be consider component units. And so it was confusing what a tribe should implement, GASB 72 or 14. And so I think the standard clarifies what to do in these cases. So we'll jump right in. So when a tribe acquires a legally separate entity, what does equity interest mean? And really it's, it's the financial interest in that legally separate organization evidenced by stock or otherwise having some type of explicit measurable right to the net resources of that organization. So um, does the equity interest of the entity your tribe acquired meet this definition of an investment? And it's really based on 
Statement 72 that defines investments. Does the tribe hold the equity interest primarily for the purpose of generating profit? And is the present service capacity of that legally separate organization based solely on its ability to generate cash? And so um, generally, I wouldn't see a typically see a casino, a tribal housing authority, uh, tribal component unit for a school, for example, meet this definition because, you know, for example, a casino, it's not just about generating profit, but it's also intended to provide employment or to create and build economic development for the reservation. So um, that's, uh, again, if your investment in that equity interest, if it meets that definition, the good news is, is that you would report it under the equity method. Uh, of accounting, which means there's not going to be any complicated or costly valuations needed to determine fair market value. Equity method is, is simply the, the tribe's share of the equity of that organization adjusted for its share of the earnings or losses um, after the date of acquisition. So overall, GASB 90 provides ease in the recognition of these investments, which is which is good news. So now let's talk about those cases when a majority equity interest does not meet the definition of an investment. In those cases, the tribe is really considered to be financially accountable for that legally separate organization, and that entity should be a component unit of the tribe. Um, so what does the standard mean when we say financially accountable? The financial accountability usually results from uh, these factors. Essentially, the, the primary government appoints a voting majority of the organization's governing body, and the tribe is really able to impose its will on the organization, or there is some potential for uh, the organization to provide specific financial benefit burdens with, with the tribe. So once it meets that criteria of a component unit, then you must go through the determination of is it a blended component unit or discreetly presented. Um, so I think that uh, I want to back up a real quick second here because it's important to note that um, if you have defined an equity interest as an investment, you would not report it as a component unit. So just wanted to clarify that before we move on to talking a, a bit more about when you've determined that it's a component unit. Okay, so at that point of determining it's a component unit, then you must go through the process of determining whether it's a blended component unit or discreetly presented component unit. And so there is um, a requirement that if it is a discrete presented component unit, you must also report uh, the as an asset within the tribe's financial statement the equity position in that component unit in the financial statements. That would be measured using the equity method, not fair market value. This is um, not new. This was a requirement a bit obscure in GASB 61. So uh, this statement also, also talks a bit more about it, so it provides a bit more clarity. And uh, it's, a, it's a bit unique, so just be, uh, be aware of that. If you have a discreetly presented component unit, there's a likelihood that you report the asset or the um, equity position of that component unit as an asset within your uh, governmental activities uh, financial statements. But however, if the component unit is considered to be blended, then the uh, assets and that position of that, it, that organization are actually presented as a fund within the tribe's financial statements. And so there's not a need to also report an equity interest in there. So just to be uh, clear about that requirement. All right. So let's now talk about those cases when reporting a component unit if the tribe acquires 100% equity interest in them. Uh, there was guidance missing from GASB Statement 69 when a government acquires an entity that remains a legally separate organization. This standard clarifies uh, that reporting. Bottom line, the component unit's balance sheet should be measured at the date of acquisition based on the consideration provided 
and also should include the net resources exchanged to complete the acquisition. So it's important to note that the um, statement of revenues and expenses should only include transactions that occurred subsequent to that date of acquisition. And so to some degree, that component unit, when acquired, uh, it's a fresh start approach. Everything um, is subsequent to that acquisition that's reported in the flows statement. So let's talk a bit about the timing and transition. Uh, the impact, uh, like I said, it's, they, they really wanted to get this out pretty quickly. So if you have a September 30th fiscal year end, you would be implementing this standard in your 9-30-2020 fiscal year. Uh, if, it's, if you have a December year end, it, you would be implementing it this year, 12-31-2019. Now, these changes really should be applied retroactively um, for the all per periods presented. If you're not presenting comparative statements, then you're just going to be a, a, a adjusting your beginning equity position to adopt this standard. Also, if you're not restating prior periods that are uh, being presented, you should be disclosing that fact. And a uh, real quick note as well is that if you've determined previously that uh, a majority equity interest was an investment, but now you've changed that to uh, it meets the definition more of a component unit. Um, that is not a retroactive reporting. Um, that you would have a for the component unit that's presented, it'd be on a perspective basis. So just keep that in mind. All right, next we're going to go through GASB 87 um, fairly quickly uh, today. Uh, in in summer, we're really going to devote an entire webcast to 87 after GASB uh, issues the implementation guidance that's expected in April, early May. Um, there's also been some discussions at GASB for delaying the standard, but we didn't want to leave here without at least kind of going over the general concepts of, the, concepts of this new requirement. So essentially, leases are no longer going to be considered uh, operating or capital. That's the big thing, big change here that's going to occur. There there obviously are some exceptions to this rule. If the lease term is uh, 12 months or less, which that includes all possible options for extending the contract um, and some other factors. So uh, just keep that in mind that now these leases are most leases that you have are going to have an impact to the balance sheet. And as of right now, um, the timing of this is that for your December year end, you would be implementing the standard um, in your 2020 year. And if you have a September 30th fiscal year end, you would be implementing this in 2021. And there are some um, retroactive reporting requirements to prior periods, so just keep that in mind. Let's go on now to a uh, poll question, Emily. All right, our final polling question. What is the weather in Fahrenheit where you are currently? And your options are A, over 65, B, 36 to 64, C, 0 to 35, or D, sub-zero. And once you have completed all CPE requirements today, you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the certification widget to the right of the slide view. I'll give everyone just a few more seconds here. And let's see what everyone had to say. Back to you. That's good to know. Uh, between our B is the best option. Glad we're not having a lot of people here from dealing with the polar vortex. It looks like we do have some sub-zero. There. Sorry, fellas. <laughs> Sorry about that. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and continue on with leases. I think this this slide right here uh, I think provides a really good illustration of the impact to um, your financial statements. If you're if you're the leasee and you enter into a lease contract, you are going to report an intangible asset for that essentially what we call right to use asset. So essentially that asset will be equal to the, the liability that you would present as leasee. 
Um, the the liability this doesn't change much. It's same concept as we had before, but essentially the liability will be the present value of the future lease payments, including some um, various costs here. But overall, you would be reporting that for almost most of your uh, leases as the, the leasee. And if you're the leaseor, if you're the leaseor, what you're going to have is two assets to report. You, will, of course, will um, have a lease receivable for these future lease payments, which to some degree would equal what the leasee is reporting as a liability. So this asset would equal that. But you're also going to continue to report that asset, that capital asset, that lease asset on your on your balance sheet as well. Um, the leaseor, of course, does not report any liability, but the leaseor would report a deferred inflow for um, essentially equaling what the lease receivable was plus any cash received up front that relates to a future period. On the next slide, this we're going to talk a bit about how, how that gets taken off the balance sheet. So that, as a leasee, uh, you would amortize over the shorter of the useful life or the lease term that intangible asset. And then the liability, of course, then would be reduced by lease payments, obviously, except for those interest expenses that hit your flow statement. But that's essentially what you'd have on the lease side. And then on the lease or, uh, you would depreciate your lease assets um, like usual, but then you would reduce any receivables from those lease payments. And then on the deferred inflow as the lease or, you would recognize revenue um, in some over the lease term or some system, systematic basis um, that gets uh, reported uh, as revenues. Okay, Ben. Okay, so one last uh, GASB standard here to update you on. So GASB 89 was issued in June 2018. And that's effective a little further out than the others we talked about. So if you're a 1231 year end, it's effective 1231 2020. Or if you're a 930 year end, it's way out in 930 2021. Uh, the purpose is to simplify accounting for interest incurred before the end of a construction period. And prior to GASB 89, interest during a construction period has only been capitalized at the enterprise proprietary fund level, uh, but not for assets that were constructed at the tribe level with governmental funds. So why is that? Well, GASB didn't really like the enterprise funds and business type activities could capitalize interest, but governments couldn't. So now nobody could do it. Uh, the standard does allow for early adoption, so that is something to be considered to simplify things potentially if you have a big construction project going on at your enterprise level. And then that way you wouldn't have to calculate the construction period interest. So potential benefit there. And that's really quick. On uh, That's what GASB 89 is all about. So I guess I'll kick it back to you, Ryan, for the last one. Sure. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I think that pretty much sums up all of the, the GASB is that you really should be paying attention to this next year for implementation guidance. Um, I, I, I think we uh, want to talk about it, the financial reporting model that, that GASB is currently looking at. Um, right now, the preliminary views document is available on the GASB's website issued back in September. Comments are actually due on this in the next couple of weeks. And I, I think we just want to encourage you to look at it, know that it's out there. And some key items to note is that really there's not going to be a whole lot of changes to the governmental fund financial statements. Uh, it appears that GASB is planning to move forward with a short-term financial resources measurement focus, which, it, you know, it's more of a short-term, you know, normally uh, due to, Items are due to convert to or generate cash, uh, pretty much following the same methodology with some minor changes. I think what really people are going to not maybe have heartburn or struggle a bit over is the uh, 
the new flow statement for proprietary funds, the revenue and expenses statement. Um, there's going to be some new sections there for, you know, non-capital subsidies, financing and investing activities, um, other items um, that are going to have a, a big change to the presentation of that statement. So, um, again, encourage you to go look at the document that's available. It does provide some illustrations of what that will look like. So I encourage you as well to uh, you know, submit comments if you have any questions about that. And for that, Emily, uh, we're at questions. All right. Uh, we do have some time for a Q&A. If you have any questions for Ben or Ryan, you can enter those in the Q&A window now. Uh, we did have a couple come in. Uh, we'll kick it off with two confirms. Do agency funds under the new fiduciary funds standards now require income statements? Ben, I can I can get, I can get that real quick here. So uh, okay. the agency funds. So there's no longer going to be agency funds now. They're they're going to be referred to as custodial funds. And yes, they will now have a flow statement. Under previous guidance, under GASB 34, uh, agency funds would only, you'd only report your assets and liabilities of your agency funds. And now you will have a flow statement for those custodial type funds uh, that will be presented in your financial statements. Great, thank you. Um, and then when is the webcast releases? Yeah, I can I can grab that too. Uh, I think we're planning for June. I think that would be pretty good from the time when GASB will um, submit their uh, implementation guidance. Uh, hopefully, around May timeframe, we'll have a better understanding of some of the concerns with implementing GASB 87, and we'll have a better idea at that point as to whether GASB is intending on delaying implementation of GASB 87. So. We're expecting June to get that get that going. We're going to, to devote an entire webcast to to leases and how to work through those um, requirements. Great, thank you. Um, how about are 457 retirement plans considered an equivalent to a 401k? Typically, so my my answer to that would be that um, it's a little it's a little complicated. Typically, 401k plans um, has employee contributions, but not employer contributions. So it likely doesn't meet the definition of a component unit, and it doesn't meet that financial benefit burden criteria. So it wouldn't be um, a component unit in that case. So it, it's unlikely that it would meet that threshold, but it is dependent on on those factors. So you'd have to kind of. I think what's helpful about uh, GASB 84 is it has a flow chart, uh, several flow charts where you could walk through the requirements of your 457 plan or, you know, there's obviously other types of deferred uh, compensation type plans out there and walk through that flow chart. And it, I think GASB 84 does a really good job at determining uh, whether it should be presented in the, as a fiduciary fund or not. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. And it looks like we had another one come in for lease accounting. If lease payments are based on sharing of future revenue, unknown but may be predicted, how might this impact the accounting on tribal casino balance sheets? Lease payments are based on sharing as well. Yeah. yeah, great question. I am going to defer until our June webcast. Uh, maybe we could save that question for then. I apologize, but I think I think it's best if we answer that in more detail when we've had a, a, an entire webcast to cover the requirements. So I have to defer. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. That looks like all of the questions that we had for today. If you think of anything else, you can still enter that into the Q&A window here and we'll follow up. Um, but other than that, thank you Ryan and Ben for a great presentation. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, 
you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts icon to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download this now. A copy of your CPE certificate will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it. Here is a survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us again next time.